Great to be with you here today to continue our Life Hack series, looking at David in the book uh, of 1 and 2 Samuel. We've been kind of centered on that. Uh, I love this series and I love these passages because as a young boy, I was always drawn to Samuel and I uh, didn't always know what to read in the Bible. I'd kind of flick it open and it always just, being my name is Sam, I'd always just read Samuel. So I reckon there's probably two of the books that I've read more than anything in the whole Bible. And I love it. My middle name's David. And uh, just this is an affinity with these passages. So I'm very passionate to share with you today. Well, uh, as most of you know, my role is a uh, youth young old pastor, um, but also have some little kitties at home. And, um, and it, it is an awesome time of life. I really do love it. The thing I love most, one of the things I love most is just the, the, bed, the bedtime routine and doing the dad thing getting Ari in bed. She's kind of nearly three now, so she just loves books, and she loves the Bible. She loves, we call them Jesus stories, but she loves it. And, and so we have a Jesus story uh, every night, and, and now it's at the point where she's, we've gone through a lot of the stories, so she'll kind of put her requests in. And her favourite story, and it's most nights she requests this one, but last night was the same. I'm like, Ari, we're going to have a Jesus story time. And she's like, Daddy, I want David and Goliath. Let's read David and Goliath. It is her favourite story. And it's so violent. <laughs> it's so violent. And like, it's particularly the bit where, she act, where David actually, you know, hurls the rock and we kind of act it out dramatically and hits Goliath in the forehead. And she's like, yes! And it, and it was like, thud, he hits the ground. I was like, yeah. So she's like, she loves David the hero. Loves David the hero. Um, but... The stories that we've been looking at, like last week with David and Bathsheba, and today we're kind of looking at the fallout from that and the consequence of that, looking at David's sons and how they do some atrocious things. These are things that are not fitting for a children's Bible story. <laughs> there, is no, there is no mentions of these stories in the picture book format because they more closely, rather than a children's book, picture story, it clo more closely re resembles a few episodes of the Game of Thrones. It really does. With the, with the death and some of the evil that happens, it really is, you know, don't go out and watch Game of Thrones. Just open up 2 Samuel. That'll give you your violent fix. Um, the Bible is awesome, isn't it? It just tells it warts and all. And it really is. That's what we see in 2, two Samuel, just dramatic stories, dramatic stories. And so we're going to get into that. Um, we're going to pick where uh, Pastor Bill left off last week with David and Bathsheba. We're going to pick that up. And I just love that, that David fell dramatically, fell horribly. And I just love, I can relate to that. Can anyone else relate to that, that you, that you stuff up, that you make mistakes? And, and it tells it so graphically. And, but I want, to, I want to give us a lesson from a profound movie called Kung Fu Panda. And I, I just love, uh, I love that. It's one of my favourite animated films. And as the panda is kind of going through his training in Kung Fu, he comes across um, this kind of inflatable uh, boxing bag. And in his training, he, he kind of, it's quite hilarious that he smacks this thing, you know, and he wasn't very good, but he smacks this thing and he kind of looks proud. And then it, but then because it's inflatable and it's weighted on the bottom, it, it goes down and it flicks back up and it basically knocks him back, knocks him out. It had a bounce back in it. And I want to tell you that as Christians, that, and when Christ is in our life and through the cross of Jesus, we ought to ought also have a bounce back in our spirit. That though we make mistakes, though we stuff up, and though we sin all the time, we need a bounce back. And I love that although David sinned terribly, he also had a bounce back in his spirit. And we pick up that story straight after as Nathan rebukes him, calls him out, and don't we need good people in our life who are going to tell us the truth, who are going to have the courage and are going to love us enough, care enough about our future and about our state that are going to tell us the truth. I wonder who, who are you surrounding yourself with? Who are you opening your life up to that you're giving permission for people to speak honestly to you without you reacting, without you shutting them down, without you separating in that relationship? We need to do that. We need to have good people. There's good people in this church as well who can be that for you if you don't already have someone. Hey, but also, so we see that. We see Nathan confronting David. And then we see basically him saying, this is what's going to happen. 
God is not going to take away your kingship, which is good news, and I'll touch on that in a second. He's not going to take away your position, but there's going to be some consequences. And we know that to be true. We know that even though there can be forgiveness, doesn't mean that God always takes away the consequences. And we've got to deal with those consequences. We've got to hopefully learn from those consequences. And so that he outlined, Nathan outlines that there's going to be trouble. The soil's not going to depart from your family. There's going to be some terrible things, things that have out them, outworked themselves in your life is going to come through in the next generation. And there's a warning in that for us, isn't there? In the choices that we make, that some of the choices that we make actually infect or get taken on by those closest to us. They, they see us give permissions to things, things that we allow and we, we do perhaps passively, but then they say, hey, if you can do that, I'm allowed to do that too. I'm very aware of that as a pastor. I need to be very careful of what I do. I need to be very careful of the words that I speak. Sometimes my wife, she's so awesome at just reminding me of who I am <laughs> in Christ. And um, honestly, Past, she's Pastor Sam doesn't need to say anything else. She just reminds me of who I am. <laughs> Pastor Sam, if I'm ever speaking like unkindly about someone, she would just remind me. That's not the way that you're supposed to. And because those things, the things that we do and the things that we say, people pick up on that and they take it on for themselves. We all have influence. We all have influence with our children, with our friends. We need to be careful what we're doing. And then we see... So all these things happen and then we see one of David's child dies. Terrible situations fall out of this part of the consequence. And then, so this David falls terribly. But then as we see in verse 20 in chapter 12, it says this. It says, David got up from the ground. Hey, we need to get up. We need to get, start getting up. If we sin, we need to repent hard. We need to embrace the grace of Jesus and we need to get up. I tell you, we need to obviously be wise about this and there's need to kind of qualify this in some areas. But when we sin, we can get straight back up. We can receive the grace of God. We don't need to wallow in self-condemnation. Through the grace of Jesus, we can actually pick ourselves up and we can get on with what we need to do because we all have things we need to do. David had things he needed to do in his position. So easily we can let our performance determine our position with God. We can let the things we do affect our relationship. We can so easily slip into that, can't we? And we can think that our moral success affects the status in our relationship with God. We can start thinking, am I saved anymore? Does God really love me? But when we know that that's not true, and we need to remember that our performance does not determine our position. The good news here is that God, in that next verse, if we've got that there, Yen, that what did God say? He says, I, I'm forgiving you. We will not die. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He doesn't take away our position. We keep our position. Some of us need to remember that today. Some of us need to receive, even right now, you need to receive the grace of God. You need to receive that forgiveness. You need to get up. That's the good news you needed today. You need to get going in your life again. A phrase that I heard often in my house from my parents was, oh, Sam, as a young person, as a teenager, I made a lot of mistakes. I, was, I, had, I had some good moments, but I also had some really bad moments. You know, it was that carelessness of a teenage boy that I'd just be breaking windows. I'd be getting detentions at school. I'd be getting into arguments, getting into fights. My first day of kindergarten, you'll love this, first day of kindergarten, I punched a kid in the nose and I got sent home. <laughs> the first day, it was a record. It's never happened since. But I tell you, on all the mistakes and all the dumb things I did, not once did I think that changed my relationship with my parents. Not once did I think that they were going to disown me. Not once did I think that that was going to take away from the unconditional love and relationship that I had from the start as a son. We need to remember that that's what it's like with God too. And some of us, just to wrap this point up, that some of us, you've got to get this in your head. You know it in your head, but you actually need to get it in your spirit every day. So that's what I had to do as a young person because I wasted too much time, too many years of an ineffective Christian life because I was always questioning my salvation. 
Always didn't know where I stood with God. But then there's all these awesome scriptures, Romans 8.1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We need to get that in our spirit every day. If you need to remind yourself every day, then do it. That, just this phrase that's biblical, but it's not a verse. It's like he has forgiven our sins, past, present, and also future. I need to know that. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that whoever is in Christ, whoever is in Christ, and we are, if we believe and we've given our life to him, is a new creation. The old has gone. You're a new creation. We need to get that on the inside. Is that good? Is that all right? Come on. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It's good news for us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace that you've been saved and through faith. This is not of yourself. You haven't earned it. It's a gift, not by works so that you can boast, so that you can't boast. And it was like God was reminding, David knew this. He's like, you didn't earn to be king. It wasn't by your good attributes. It wasn't by the things that you earned. You didn't make your way through the ranks before I chose you to be king. I chose you by grace. I appointed you. You're a a child. All you were doing is working a little bit, but there was nothing to you. He was handpicked by God. And it's the same with us. We're handpicked by His grace. And that's the thing that gives us salvation as we receive that. So it's not by what we do that we earn it. And so it's not by what we don't do or the things we do wrong that's going to take it away as well. Come on, your performance doesn't change your position. David got up. We need to have a bounce back in our spirit. Point number two, we need an anointing for our appointing. We need an anointing for our appointing. I'm going to get a bit excited in a second. Hey, I tell you, there's no higher responsibility at the time than that of king. That was the highest responsibility. And so you've got to imagine what it would be like as a young person taking on that kind of responsibility as king. And so within that, there was, there was your, the military leader, you are in t- God has put you in charge of leading all of Israel in the correct and right worship with God. And also you're the chief justice when you're appointed as king. You've got three, those three main roles. And so there's a huge amount of responsibility. And unlike David, we're not king, but we have responsibility in our own lives too. Whether it be maybe you're a husband, maybe you're a father, or maybe you've got it's just any sort of job, there's a responsibility attached to that. Or you're a carer. There's all these realms that we can have responsibility. Or let's say for the point of my sermon, that, that these are appointments. That these are appointments of responsibility that God has given us. And what I want to tell you today, that where God calls you, He also equips you. He also equips you. And this is good news for us as well, because when David was announced as king, when the prophet Samuel came to him, he didn't just appoint him and give him the responsibility, but he also, with that appointing, came an anointing. And we need to know this as well. And let's read in 1 Samuel 16, it says, So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. Come on, let's receive some of this today. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. I want to encourage you today, in what area of your responsibility do you need to step into the appointing but also receive God's anointing? Without that anointing, David would have never been able to do anything in his role as king. But how often do we slide into that space of being disempowered, seeing the duty of our responsibilities without actually feeling the power and the presence of God to be able to do it. Sometimes we can get so disempowered and go through the motions and we actually feel, I'm in this on my own. I actually start to shut down. How can, and we sort of go into this passive survival mode in our areas of our life, whatever that may be. Come on, we need the presence and the power of God in my life. We need to be refilled with the Holy Spirit. And in 1 John, I think it says, if I've got the right, um, 1 John 2, 27, as for you, the anointing which you receive from Him abides in you. You have the Holy Spirit in you. 
You have the Holy Spirit in you. We've got that power. We know those verses that say He's not given us a spirit of timidity or passivity, but a spirit of power. A power not only to get up and do the fighting Goliath, like the once on, like, yeah, big strong thing, but also an enduring power. An enduring power to actually help us to be faithful in our responsibilities. Because who knows that, you know, as a parent, in our jobs, it's not just getting up one day. You've got to walk in that responsibility today, tomorrow, the next day. You need to keep going. You need to carry that thing. We need God's anointing to be able to do the thing that He has called us to do. We need to, we need to get on our knees in prayer again. We need to start turning on those worship tracks again. Because I tell you, you think, how do I get full of the Holy Spirit? I get full of the Holy Spirit when I start to pray. But sometimes I don't feel like praying, so what do I do? I just blast some Christian worship. And I find that as those songs wash over me and as I start to sing it out, I start to remember who is really the King, who is really the one who carries the responsibility, who is really the one who has said, I'm going to fill with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you everything you need. I'm going to give you strength. And as I get into that place, I actually feel something happen on the inside. I get filled with the Holy Spirit and all of a sudden I feel like I can. But it's not until I get with Him. It's not until I get within His presence. And for David, it was the same. He was anointed, but he still had to come to God. He still had to inquire of the Lord. He wasn't just on his own. It's the same for us today. I tell you that when I'm spending time in the presence of God, and I don't do it perfectly, my life is messy sometimes, but I try. But when I do, and when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, I tell you I'm a better husband. I'm a better father. I'm a more efficient worker. You think, you know, how can, I, how can I put aside time every day to spend with the Lord? I tell you, when I do, I'm better at work. I'm more successful in my, in my workplace when I have that time with Him, when I get full of God. I tell you, it's one of the best professional things we can ever do is spend time with Jesus. Come on. Forget about going to conferences. <laughs> Forget about... Listening to you, boss. No, don't. That's not true. Listen to you, boss. That's in the Bible as well. <laughs> hey, that was a couple of little freebies. I want to move into the rest of our story today because although David got up and he did these things really well, there were some massive flaws in his life because we know that God didn't call him for who he was. Men after God's own heart, probably a best description of that from the commentators is just chosen by God. So there's nothing actually awesome about him. He does some good things, but he also does some terrible things. And we see those today after the David and Bathsheba incidents. We see David's lustful traits manifesting in his son's life. His son was Amnon. And we're going to talk about Absalom as well. We see his weaknesses and his failure to confront things in the life of his family. Things that he gave permission to. And also his inept parenting ability. I want to tell you, if you're a parent, who's a parent in the house today? If you're a parent, grandparent, you're awesome. You're awesome. And you are already doing a better job than King David. He was rubbish. He was rubbish. Let's read about what happens here in an awful, awful story. which straight after in 2 Samuel 13. What a warning this is for the consequence of sin. All right, in the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom. He fell in love with his sister. You thought your family was messed up. It's good news for you today. Amnon became so obsessed with his sister Tamar that he became sick. What a weirdo. This, she was a virgin and it was impossible for him to do anything to her. Now Amnon, sorry, I should put a, this is probably an R-rated story. This is full on. Um, So any sensitive ears, you can just block some of this stuff out. That's fine. Now Amnon had an advisor named Jonadab, son of someone, David's brother. (laughs) Jonadab was a very shrewd man. He wasn't a good man. He's not the kind of person we were talking about that you want in your ear, giving you encouragement. He asked Amnon, why do you, you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? What would you tell me? Amnon said to him, I'm in love with my sister Tamar. The brother of Absalom's, um, play on, go to bed and pretend to be ill. He comes up, they come up with this plan of how she will come into his room. And they plotted this evil plot so that he would assault her sexually. And it's this awful plot. So they come up with this plan. 
And then they bring this plan to David. Now look at what David does or doesn't do, probably more to the point. After they bring this plot to him and they say, why don't you bring some food in? Because you're sick. So, so David heard this and he sent word to tame out the palace. No questions. No, why is that what you wanted to do? And what I found out was this was not just inappropriate for the sister to go and do this while he was sick. It was actually illegal. It was actually against the law in the ancient Near East for a woman, particularly not who wasn't their wife, to actually come into their personal chambers and to be in the pre- without anyone else there. So it was actually an illegal thing that he asked. So David did nothing. David did not question it. He just said, sent word for Tamar to come. And so this plot unveils and so this terrible thing happens and Tamar was abused and then thrown out and it says in one of this sickening scripture that says Amnon hated her and threw her out. And she pleaded to, for him to do the right thing in the society and marry her so she was looked after because she was, um, and he didn't. And after all, all this, it says in verse 21, when King, King David heard this, he was furious. He was furious. But then when we read on, we see that for two years, in fact, he doesn't do anything about this situation. This injustice that was done to Tamar, and in his, not just as a father, but in his role as king, as the head of justice, this was his job, to bring justice in this situation. And David did nothing. I tell you that David should have been suspicious. He had no idea what was going on. He was, he was quite innocent of knowing. He, he didn't see this coming. But I tell you, he should have seen it coming. And if you're a parent of a teenager, you know this. If you've got a son like Amnon, you've got a creepy, weird son like Amnon, it does, something like this doesn't just happen. You can see it happening. And so if you've got a son, if, if you've got you know, a son or daughter, even if they're a good son or daughter, I tell you, you're on their Facebook page. You're on their Instagram you're like, when they're not looking, when they've gone to the bathroom, not they'll probably take this to, with their bathroom, but you're, you're grabbing their phone and you're having a look at who they're talking to, what they're saying. You're eavesdropping at their door. You're listening to their conversations. You're doing background checks on who they're hanging around with. <laughs> Parents, isn't that true? You know that. I work with teenagers and I know the kind of temptations that there are, even for good, even for really good teenagers. We need, as parents, you need to be, have your finger on the pulse. You need to know what's going on in the life of your young. You need to know, you need to have a PhD in, in your child. You need to know what makes them tick. You need to know how to head them off at the past. David didn't do any of this. David didn't do any of this. And it was, and it was negligible. His failure to pick up on this, his failure to confront it, and his failure to do something was actually... We don't know if it would have happened in the future, but who knows, if he had done something, if he had picked it up, he could have stopped this from occurring. I want to encourage us with that. Hey, if you see something happening, maybe it's not in your family, maybe it's in a friend. If you see something, hey, would you say something? Would you just lovingly just say, hey, what's going on there? What's that about? I want to share a story um, again about my family. I had awesome parents. Very thankful to God for that. But in growing up, if I wanted to do the wrong thing, I had to work blooming hard. It wasn't, they didn't, my parents didn't make it easy for me. You know, even if I wanted to go over to my friend's house, I would get, my mum would give me the third degree. And she would like, who's going to be there? What are you going to be doing? What are their parents like? Do they drink alcohol? Are they Christians? And she would just ask me all these questions. And most of the time I wouldn't even bother asking. Because I know that after all that, she wouldn't be satisfied. So she'd, she'd get on the phone wasn't one of these, it was kind of one of, one of these. Um, but she'd get on the phone to the mother who she'd never met and she'd, and she'd say, ask all those same questions and she'd say, you know, my son Sam, we're a Christian family. You know, Sam, he's not allowed to watch M-rated movies. He's not allowed to play violent video games. He want, shouldn't be able to have alcohol. And so it was embarrassing. But I tell you, my parents, my parents had their finger on the pulse. They made it hard for me to do the wrong thing. Parents, there's a, in, this, in this passage, we, parents need to take an active approach to parenting. 
We need to be seeking advice in the areas where we, we don't feel, we, we feel ill-equipped, be seeking it out, talking to people who know more than us. David's passiveness made Amnon's behaviour possible. Let's not be passive in our relationships. Confrontation could have changed the conclusion in this story. And as we roll this story on, we see that by David's inability to confront and do something and to bring justice, Absalom, furious, hadn't spoken to Amnon. And so he actually plots over the course of a two-year period where David is inactive, he is active in his revenge. And he plots out in the next chapters, he plots to kill Amnon. And then he comes to David and he says, I want to throw this feast. And David knew this was dodgy. He knew it was dodgy. And he says, what do, you, what do you want to do? Why do you want to gather Amnon? What are you wanting to bring Amnon to you? He knew something was dodgy. But yet again, passively, he didn't ask questions. He didn't probe. He didn't think, what's going on there? I'm not going to... He should have stopped it then, but he didn't. He didn't. And again, so what happened? Amnon went to him. Absalom in, in vengeful um, actions murdered Amnon. And then he fled. And then as we, just a very quick, what happens is Absalom just turns against the king for a variety of reasons. Maybe inacti- inactivity was part of it, his lack of action. But he, he ends up plotting against the king and tries to take his throne. He actually wants to kill his father. There's a warning in there for us. There's things that if we don't confront at the start, when we see it kind of rear its head, if there's things that we don't confront, can snowball and actually be turn into a huge conflict that can hurt yourself but also hurt others. Point three, it's dangerous to disengage. What do you need to confront in your own life before it gets out of control? Or what do you need to confront in the life of someone close to you? Lovingly confront. We cannot change what we continue to tolerate. Failure to confront gives permission for things to continue. Come on, we need to take action, be proactive in our relationships, in our life. I want to talk to you about a time where I was confronted. I want to share a personal story about how I was confronted, making mistakes. Aria had just been born. She was about six months old. And um, I was still still doing all my, I had all my normal responsibilities. And I thought I was doing really good. And guys, sometimes we can have no idea. Isn't that true, ladies? (laughs) <laughs> hey, don't say anything. Um, <laughs> sometimes, but honestly, sometimes we can be like David and we can just have no idea what's going on. And, and I had no idea what was going on. I thought, you know, Tanya came to me and she said, there's a, there's a problem. There's a problem that you're not, that you're a husband, but you're not being a husband. You're doing the things that a dad should do, but you're not engaged in being a father to your children. And so sometimes we can think that just because I'm doing it means, means that I'm, I'm done. I can t- check the box. But I tell you, that's not true. I was, I was at home, but I wasn't present. I wasn't present. I was letting my work stress come in. I was letting my sermon pre- preparation create out my family time. And, and I was never there. I'll, and Tanya's like, oh, you, you don't even have time to look at me in the eye. You don't have time to engage. Ask me how I'm going. And... And I just, I'm like, man, that was a wake-up call. And I'm glad that she had a conversation with me about it. And she said, Sam, if you continue to do this, that's going gonna, gonna to hurt our relationship. She needed to confront something in me so that I could make a change and making changes so that things wouldn't get out of control. What, do you, what conversation do you need to have, a loving conversation to bring things to light? Or what do you need to deal with in your own life? This is exactly the place that David was in. David was the king, but he wasn't acting like the king. He wasn't fully there. He wasn't worshipping God. He wasn't getting full of God. He wasn't stepping into that anointing. I was disengaged at home. And perhaps there's some areas of your life where you're disengaged as well. Through a whole lot of good reasons, but you're disengaged. You're at work, but you're not at work. You're at home, but you're not at home. You've got friends around, but you're not really being a friend. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's even your finances. You're disengaged from your finances and things are really happening there that you need to get control of. Maybe it's your diet. Maybe it's your health. I'll tell you, winter is here. (laughs) I need to be engaged in that area of my life. Praise God. 
This is what we see in David, a disengaged king who failed in his responsibilities. David was elected into the position of king and one of his main roles was to fight injustice. I'll tell you, what do we need to do in these areas? What do we, how, do we, how do we do these things that I'm calling us to do? We need to fight. We need to fight. We invite keys up. Thanks, Catherine. I wonder what area you need to start fighting in again. Because it's so easy to get into a situation where things just are the way they are. I'm so used to things of going through the motions that I actually don't know any different. But maybe today, God's calling you to actually draw a line in the sand and say, this is going to be the moment where you become re-engaged in this area of your life that you've been disengaged for so long that you actually can't remember what it's like to fight. Maybe today is going to be your moment to do that. I want to challenge you. There's going to be a time to respond. David got stuck. He went through the motions and he found himself in the place for a variety of reasons where he was no longer confronting, he was no longer fighting, he was no longer engaged. And what God, I would suggest, would have wanted for him is to call upon God, inquire of God and say, God, I need your help to bring about justice in this situation. I need your help to go and confront this situation. I need restoration in my relationship with with Absalom and Amnon. I need help in that. I need to call upon you. Would you give me something that I need to do that? We don't see that in the Scripture. What I believe God was calling to is say, hey, hey David, remember when I appointed you, I also anointed you. Remember that, remember that Goliath bit? You know, you may have forgotten that. It was a little story in the Bible. But you went out to fight and you knew it wasn't just you. You knew, you knew there was a point in your life where you knew it just wasn't you with your responsibility on your own. You knew that I was with you. You knew that fight wasn't just your fight. You knew at that point, this is what I believe God wants to say to us too in your areas of responsibility, that there's this awesome verse in Zephaniah that God would have wanted to say to David and remind him that although you're king and although you've got responsibilities, who is ultimately in charge of that area of responsibility? And the the verse in Zephaniah says this, the Lord, the King of Israel. Who's the King of Israel? The Lord. He's the King. He's the one who's in control. He's the one who is fighting. He's the one who's at work. He's the one that's sovereignly working, even though we can't see it. Not you, David. Call upon the real King. What about for you? Hey, why don't we stand to our feet? As we get ready to respond, what about you in your area? In your, in your role in your family? In your workplace? God's calling you to fight again, to re-engage. Would you re-engage today? Fight for your marriage. Come on, today's the day. Some of you are sitting there thinking, my marriage needs help. Come on, come out the front today. Fighting for your health, your relationship, with your child, your relationship with God. You've been going through the motions. Get it right today. Or if you've never given your life to Christ, you've been putting it off. Today's the day. Today's the day. Don't wait. A a line in the sand. No longer are things going to stay the same. I'm going to recommit. I'm going to take action. I'm going to be proactive. I'm going to bounce back. Today's the day. And as you do this, as you step out the front, or if you make this decision in your heart to re-engage and to fight, God's not going to leave you on your own. He's going to say, I've appointed you, but I've also given you the anointing. And you might think, I don't need to come down the front. That's true, you don't. But there's something scripturally about laying on of hands. There's something we believe about the manifest presence of God that, that has it this ability to shift something. What needs to shift in your life? As we get ready to sing, for those, for those who need to bounce back, that you've been stuck in that place of I've done the wrong thing and you haven't been able to get out, today, you come forward, you receive the grace of God. Number two, you need to be full of the Holy Spirit again. Say, God, I need, that's me. I need to respond to that word. I need your feeling. I need that anointing in my life for my area of responsibility. You cry out for help. God wants to help you. 
He wants to give you strength and power. And the last one, you need to fight for something. You need to fight. God's calling you to fight. I want you to respond now to that. If God's calling you to those things, if there are any of those areas, as we begin to sing, if any of those things have touched you and you, you're, God's calling you to fight, God's calling you to respond, it's no longer time to be passive. It's time to be proactive and say, God, I need you.